Luke chapter 13. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, that's where we're going to be. But uh, I don't know about you, but you know once you reach adulthood, right? When you reach adulthood, uh, there are some certain things that change. Like, for instance, I kind of get excited about my favorite grocery store, right? You know what I mean? Amen on that? Like, uh, there are certain grocery stores that I literally get excited to go to. And you know that you're like an adult who's grown up when that's the case. Uh, it's no longer the mall or, you know, the game store or whatever. But uh, Costco's obviously one of my, my, one of my favorites, especially um, when they're serving free food. Uh, that's great, right? One of the other places I like to go to is Wegmans. And uh, yeah, woo! Wegmans is actually the number one grocery store uh, in the nation. Um, It's the most visited, it's the best, and the good news is, is it's really inexpensive. I mean, you can go get three tomatoes for like 24 bucks, and so it's awesome, right? Yeah, right. It's like, why is my bill $500? I only got two bags of groceries. Wegmans is kind of expensive, uh, but the experience is great. Sometimes they hand out free food, and uh, other times they just have a lot of different options, and um, they've got this like delicious bakery aisle with like baked goods that are just right there that are saying, eat me. Uh, freshly baked bread. Um, you can go actually eat there. I mean, they have like a, like a buffet restaurant, pizza, coffee. I mean, they have the works. Wegmans is awesome. Well, I was reading a story not too long ago of some sick, twisted individual who actually went into several different grocery stores and was spraying poison on different foods. Isn't that messed up? Yeah, they caught the guy, um, and I looked up just even this week. They, they still haven't came out with what the motive was, but this man was caught just going into a grocery store and spraying poison on meats, fruits, and vegetables. Now that's, that's pretty messed up. You have to be a sick, twisted individual to want to just randomly uh, sow seeds of evil in a store like Wegmans or Costco, and uh, it causes us to have some fear, right? I mean, aren't you going to think twice before going to the grocery store and buying food that's easily accessible to somebody like that. Um, what, what's good is that people did their job, right? He was caught on camera. Uh, the store manager, even though the store manager um, didn't catch him uh, necessarily, they still caught him on video, uh, and the authorities were able to um, incarcerate and prosecute this man. Now, Wegmans has two options, as I see it. Option number one is they can close their stores because of the evil this man had did, uh, and maybe, maybe he would inspire other people to do this same thing as an, as an act of terror. I mean, isn't that a legitimate option? One way to make it sure that no one would ever do that to your store again is, is to close it. And they would eliminate all the evil. Or they could keep their grocery stores open, but it would permit an opportunity for, for evil. But it also creates a lot of opportunity for good. Uh, they could feed their families. Um, they could provide food for us. Uh, They could increase their security to make sure that if there was any grocery store that you could trust, it would be Wegmans. Now, Wegmans' motto is simply this, helping families live healthier and better lives through food, and they want every day to be the best that they have to offer. Every day to be the best that they have to offer. Well, what did Wegmans decide to do? They decided to stay open, just like many other stores, and they're going to remain vigilant to try to combat as much evil as possible. But at the same time, they cannot eliminate evil, because if they eliminated evil, all the stores would close. That's kind of the same thing that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus gives us this parable where he tells us this story about the nature of the world, the purpose of God, and he lists different characters throughout it, and he also talks about the end of the world. And so if you'll read along with me in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying this, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, created an awesome grocery store like Wegmans. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, and the tares became evident also, the slaves of the landowner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares, or weeds? Tares, the same thing as weeds. And he said to them in verse 28, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may also uproot the wheat with them. 
allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So here we have this parable of Jesus talking about God's original intention and creation for the world, and he specifically categorizes himself as the the planter of the good seed. Uh, And thankfully, Jesus actually explains this parable in detail later on in the chapter, and we're going to get to that in a few moments. But a little bit of background is this. The Jews had this superficial ideology of superiority in their mind. In other words, they thought God's big plan is about us. Or as Jesus comes along and he shares this parable and he says, God's big plan is about the world. And he chooses to use you to accomplish his big plan. But it's not necessarily going to go down how you think it's going to go down. You see, the Jews thought that God was going to come. And through the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Good Sower, he was going to create a physical kingdom that would dominate the entire world. The Jews would no longer be subject to the Romans, the Assyrians, uh, the Greeks, uh, the Persians, but that they were going to rule the world. And so the Messiah comes, and they're like, we can't wait for the Messiah. We can't wait for the Messiah. And the Messiah comes, and he ushers in a spiritual kingdom that's not made of flesh and bone, that's not made of physical things, that doesn't have literal crowns, but has spiritual ones. And so you can see how this parable really impacts the Jewish mind. God isn't going to eradicate evil until the end of the world. God isn't going to give you the ability to be kings and priests until it's all done with. And so for the Jewish mind, it really destroyed their idea of God's time, uh, his time plan, and, and what exactly he was going to do. Let me share with you the interpretation of the story. If you'll skip down to verse 36, Jesus explains it to us. It says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, there are, uh, they are the sons of the kingdom. And so Jesus identifies himself here as the sower who satisfies. He says, the son of man who put good seed in the world, uh, that's, that's, that's me. That's who I am, your Messiah. And the sons of the kingdom, he says, are good. That means the church, in the eyes of God, are good. That's, that's what Jesus calls them. And so I want you to think of it like this, right? We all know what a seed is, don't we? Hopefully you do, uh, even though our culture is moving away from, you know, actually planting and harvesting things, uh, we go to the grocery store. I was reading, uh, this is so ridiculous, uh, it was when Jay Leno did, did uh, the late night, and sometimes he would read really funny news clippings uh, from different crazy people, and this woman wrote into the newspaper how she thought it was horrible that hunters would actually go out and kill animals. And she says, why don't you just do the humane thing like we all do and go get our meat from a store? (laughs) Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, totally. She has no idea of what reality is. Anyways, so the good seeds, here's the thing about the good seeds. They have the potentiality to build fruit and to grow fruit. So for wheat, for instance, it can grow into a full plant. It has that potentiality and it can uh, grow in such a way that can be harvested. It's actually profitable. And that's what I want you to think of yourself as, as good seed that isn't yet perfect, isn't yet fully grown, but has the potential to be that. Jesus would often use this type of um, references in scripture uh, because the agriculture was a huge part of their life. Um, Everyone had a hand to play in, in agriculture. And so he would often say things like this, you can tell a person by their fruit, In Matthew chapter 21, for instance, uh, Jesus woke up early in the morning, and he was out on the outskirts of the city. And on his way back into the city, he grew, the scriptures say he grew hungry, and he saw a fig tree. Does anybody like figs uh, in here? I like like dates, you know, that have a bunch of sugar and are dried out. (laughs) Uh, I don't really like dates. I like sugar. And so Jesus walks up to this fig tree, and there aren't any figs there. And so he curses the fig tree. Uh, and it withers and it dies in the instant, in that instant, and the disciples are really surprised because this tree that was alive, even though it didn't have any fruit, died instantly. And Jesus looked at that tree as a parable of Israel. He didn't curse the tree um, because he didn't like it. He cursed the tree because the fruit that it was supposed to have wasn't there. 
And that's how it was for the nation of Israel. Israel was supposed to produce a certain kind of fruit, but it wasn't there. And so God did away with the nation of Israel. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, Yes, you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So if you ask yourself this morning, what kind of seed am I? Am I a, 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 a wheat or am I a weed? Well, look at your actions. Look at your beliefs. Look at what you do and what you say, and that will be a large indicator determining the type of person that you are. Now, Jesus goes on uh, with, the, with the story explaining it in verse 38. He says, in the tares of the sons of the evil one, um, in the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now, I want to point out something very important. Who is listed here as the enemy? It is the devil. And so often we find in life people of different religious systems, people of different ideologies, people in different denominations. Sometimes it's very tempting to view these people as the enemy. And in some specific cases, they often are. But I think that we need to get in the mindset of identifying who the true enemy is and who is a victim of the enemy. You see, Satan is the enemy. Satan is the deceiver and the manipulator, and there are a lot of different people with a lot of false beliefs and false practices who have been victims of the enemy, and thus by default, they are on his side. But often I have found people who believe false things, it's because of ignorance. It's because of a lack of being interested in studying and finding out the truth. And so it changes the way that we deal with people. When we are against somebody, for instance, who doesn't agree with something that we think or believe, we shouldn't necessarily view them as our arch enemy who we have to kill and destroy metaphorically with our words and our doctrine. It just changes the way that we view people. And so even though they're on the side of the enemy, even though they've been sown as seeds of the enemy, they're not necessarily the ultimate culprit being the devil. And so um, verse 26, he says, when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And so there should be this contrast between wheat and tares. There's, there's evidence. You can start to see the difference here. Um, I have a picture that I want to show you up on the screen. This is, this is the problem, is that the, the weeds looked a lot similar, looked very similar to the wheat. And so you didn't want to take out the, the weeds necessarily until it was fully grown, right? Then you could really be sure that a weed was a weed and a wheat was a wheat. And so that, that plays into Jesus' story here as he explains to us this parable. And so if I, were to, if I were to categorize a son of the evil one or a bad seed, here are two things that I would say. Number one, a son of the evil seed or a child of the evil seed is somebody who does not accept the truth about the deity and the messiahship of Jesus. Somebody who says that Jesus is just a created angel, uh, or that Jesus is just a God of many gods, or that Jesus was a good teacher or a good man and, and not the Lord uh, of heaven, not God in the flesh. These are people who are seeds of the evil one. And I would say another uh, categorization of the evil seed would be those who live a lifestyle of indulging in the flesh. You see, there could be actually some evil seeds sitting here this morning. Yes, you might believe the right things, but your lifestyle is totally and utterly radically different than the culture. And here's what that shows us. That, so, that shows us that you don't really believe in the deity and the messiahship of Jesus. You see, because truth affects the way that you live. And if you really believe the things about Jesus, it is going to radically change the way that you live and you function. And so there are going to be certain things about your life that are going to be completely and utterly different uh, than the way that God wants them to be, if you are a, a tear or a weed, so to speak. And so there are a lot of people sitting in pews that aren't wheat, and they're not going to be gathered by God and put into his barn because they're living a lifestyle of deception. Here's what Harold Fowler writes. The sons of the evil one are the product of a false, inadequate, a product of the shame, the deceptive, that they too have taken into their being in exchange for truth. So we're looking at these different characters in the story. Jesus goes on to explain, verse 39, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers, the servants who ask, do you want us to go uproot the, the, the weeds? They are who? The angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The son of man 
will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun and the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Something I'd like to point out is that in this story we find this tension, right? This, this hardcore tension of, of life. And if you could think of it like this, there's two activities that are going on, the work of Christ and the work of the devil, and they are running down through history, paralleling each other. One isn't diminishing the other. And so Jesus first gives us this order of the end as they're running throughout history. The first thing that he gives us the order is this, uh, and we see this in the scriptures. The angels asked, do you want us to remove the tares now? And what was Jesus' response? He said, no. Let them grow until judgment. And so we notice that God is going to allow both evil and good to run throughout time unto their maturity of when they're separated. And I've already shown you that picture of, of how similar the two different plants look. But here's the other thing that we notice about the story is that God permits evil while promoting good. And furthermore, God promises to eliminate the evil, but he allows for it to grow for now. Now, a lot of people have been duped. I, myself, was a huge fan of the Left Behind series. Tim Leahy, Kirk Cameron, maybe many of you are familiar with this. And they teach certain things like rapture, right, or the Great Tribulation. Neither of those words or those ideas necessarily are found in the New Testament. And furthermore, the rapture ideology says this, that all of the Christians are taken first, and the non-Christians are left behind to go through a Great Tribulation, But look at the plain teachings of Jesus. Who are the ones who are taken first by the angels? According to verse 30. Look what he says. Take the tares first. This word taken is lombano. It's the same word used in John chapter 18 where it says Jesus was taken for incarceration. Uh, It carries this idea to be taken, to be seized beyond your control for punishment. And so the order of the end is that those who are of the bad seed... Those who are not in Christ are actually taken first. And then those who are in Christ are left. They are left to stand before God in judgment, and they are left to be welcomed into heaven. This same word left is aphasis. It means to send away. It's the same word used in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Jesus says, those who are, or where Peter says, those who are baptized are forgiven of their sins. Their sins are literally uh, uh, sent away, um, so to speak. And so we find this very sacred truth that the order of the end of the world are the evil people are seized, taken for incarceration. The good are left to be rewarded with heaven. Uh, And this takes place at the judgment or otherwise the harvest called the end of the world. So here are three really quick things that I want to share with you that we'll be talking about in this story. Number one, there is no second chance. When Jesus comes back, that's it. There's no tribulation that's going to convince you um, of of Jesus' deity and messiahship. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, uh, after every person dies, they're appointed for judgment. Number two, there's no boogeyman antichrist. Oh, look at this businessman who's the European leader of the world. This is just patently false. There may be evil men. There may be evil positions, but we are not waiting for some evil boogeyman that's going to come up and control the world. Uh, And this is what is often referred to as the Antichrist. Well, in 1 John, uh, he deals with the Antichrist, and just look at what he has to say. He says, just as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have already appeared. You see, the Antichrist isn't just one person. The Antichrist can be many people. John goes on to say this in chapter 4, verse 3, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This spirit is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. It's now already in the world. Number three, there is no great tribulation. This word, great tribulation, this phrase is not found in the New Testament. It's just simply not there. And so people have these different ideas of Jesus' second coming, that he'll come back and he'll rapture the saints, and then there'll be a great tribulation. 
Uh, and they debate on when Jesus is going to come back. Is it before the tribulation? Is it during the tribulation? Is it after the tribulation? And so somebody asked me, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? And I said, I'm much trib. And that's what the Bible teaches, that tribulation is now. Uh, we are going through it now. We're not waiting for it to come in the future. Paul said in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so do not be fooled, do not be deceived. Uh, The Left Behind series is good fictional literature that you should watch for fantasy, but it is not what the Bible teaches. And so I want you to think of it like this, and Jesus giving us this illustration, walking through this tension. We all usually, typically, most of us, have headphones, right? We have headphones, and in one side is Beethoven. It is the most beautiful compilation of music that you would ever hear. It just sounds so rich and so satisfying and so pleasant. And on the, ra- on, on the other side, on, on, the, on the right side, you've got loud noise. Just the worst, most screeching sound. I was going to play it for you, but I thought maybe it would be too terrible for your ears. I mean, think about nails being scratched down a chalkboard. That just causes you just to shriek and just to just be so utterly repulsed by this sound, right? It's like the most annoying sound in the world that just makes you sick. Well, each and every person in this room has a set of headphones. And you're walking through life with the weeds and the wheat, And there are two sounds that you are forced to listen to, both good and evil. And you have to strategize and plan and live your life in such a way that drowns out one and that listens to the other. And that's tough, right? I mean, listening to two different things at once and trying to live your life through those things, it can be a very difficult thing to do. And this is our walk through the field. Now, I want to take the last 10 minutes to explain, uh, not just explain the story, but to apply it to ourselves. We saw the order of the resurrection. We saw this principle that God is going to let evil uh, reign through this world. And, uh, And so the first question that I want to ask you this morning is, who are you in the story? Are you the wheat or are you the weeds? What is your belief system? What is your behavior like? The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are not, uh, to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you failed the test? So here's the question. Does your lifestyle match up with what you believe to be true about Jesus? Do your actions reflect what the scriptures teach about how you should live and what you should believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Do you believe that he resurrected from the dead? Does your life portray the new lifestyle character as a product of the truth that you've accepted? Are you displaying the right kind of results that God promises? He uses this word fruit in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. As a plant should grow and produce fruit, so a Christian should grow and produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And so we notice while the good seeds are not perfect, they are growing to maturity. They are growing, ready to be harvested. They are going through the growing process. Are you growing? Are you changing? Or are you dying? You see, as Chris talked about last week, are you making yourself ready? In other words, when I get knocked down by my mistakes, do I get back up and turn to God or to something else? Do I still believe the essentials of the Christian faith? Am I actively working on overcoming my sin and growing in the knowledge of the Lord? And these are really important questions that we should ask ourselves. You see, because it's important to judge yourself now rather than being judged at the end. And we don't like that word judged in our culture, do we? I mean, one of the most popular quoted verses in the Bible is, judge not lest you be judged. Uh, You know what I'm saying? That's not necessarily what the Bible teaches. We should judge ourselves now. We should examine ourselves now within the light of the gospel. Here's another question that I want to focus on, and this is going to be uh, really important. Why does God allow this good and evil tension? Why does he allow these two things to go throughout history? Are there any good reasons that God has for permitting and allowing evil? And I want to share some of these things with you this morning. Number one, God is at work. Why does God permit and allow the weeds to grow and maybe even overtake some of the wheat? 
Well, God is at work. And if God takes up the weeds, he is forced to take up the wheat as well. You see, because judgment only happens once. And the moment that God declares the world to be judged and condemned, it's over. And so we find this teaching in in 2 Peter chapter 3. Knowing this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come, following after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? You ever heard that before? Have you ever cried out, God, where are you? Why won't you just end this mess? Well, here's what it says in verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see, God knows when the last person is going to be saved, and that's worth the risk. Just like a person continuing to shop at Wegmans, it's worth the risk because there is good that takes place. Number two, the reason why God allows evil to take place is because evil is temporary, but the afterlife is forever. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Evil is temporary. It's not going to last forever. This too shall pass. C.S. Lewis wrote this, They say some uh, of temporal suffering... No future bless can make up for it, not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. You see, God allows evil because he sees the beginning and the end. He sees eternity. And the evil that you experience and you go through is not even close to being compared with the glory that is to be revealed. Here's another reason why God allows evil. Uh, God permits evil because God is working out his good. He wants you to freely choose him. You see, free agency in this moral arena, uh, it is really good for us because God can't force you to love him. God will not force you to love him, and God will not force you to freely choose what is right all the time. That's illogical. You can't force someone to freely choose. And this makes our choices really actually matter. Let me give you an illustration. I have a picture of my family uh, and our beautiful baby girl, Piper. She is just the joy of our life. I thank God for her every single day. Angel and I experienced immense amount of pain and suffering uh, in the pregnancy process and, and even before. But there is something true about that evil and that pain that I experienced that causes me to give thanks to God for her every single day. And Angel and I made the free will choice to have Piper. We don't know if she's going to choose evil or good. We can't control the good or the evil that she chooses. But our intimacy with Piper will grow and blossom because she freely chooses to love us, to obey us, to honor us. And she could cause Angel and I great pain. She could choose to walk away from the Lord. She, something could happen to her, uh, and she could leave this world far before she should. But because she freely chooses to love us, Despite the potential for evil, that increases our intimacy. And so it is with God. God has created this world with our free will choice to choose him. And if it wasn't for the possibility of evil, our intimacy with God would never be what it could be. Here's another reason why God permits evil is because it forms our character. And the Bible talks about this. And and for the sake of time, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over the explaining of this. But God allows evil to take place in our life because it forms our character. But without that that evil, our character would never be formed. Here's another reason. The love bonds forged in suffering are good. Peter Van uh, Inwagen, he's a philosophy professor at Notre Dame University. He writes this. Free will is necessary for love. Love, and not only erotic love, implies free will. The essential connection between love and free will is beauty, uh, is beautifully illustrated in Ruth's declaration to her mother-in-law, mother-in-law Naomi. And this is found in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. And this is one of the most gut-wrenching, heart-moving stories. Ruth said to, to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou deest, I will die. And there I will be buried. So the Lord uh, do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. 
That was the King James Version, which is a little hard to pronounce sometimes. <laughs> you know, KJV is wonderful. But anyway, so the point being is that if it wouldn't have been for Naomi's husband passing away, this love bond would have never formed. And then we have the solidarity with Christ is formed because of evil, because of suffering. Alvin Plantiga, he is also a philosophy professor at Notre Dame, probably the most prestigious philosophy professor. He wrote this, It is a good thing that the followers of Christ share in his sufferings, because this means uh, fellowship with him at a very profound level and a way in which they achieve a certain kind of solidarity with him. And he says this, Perhaps all of us who suffer will welcome the opportunity in retrospect. It also enhances the image of God in them. God permits suffering because our experience and our intimacy and our relationship with him would be uh, an incredible thing. An incredible thing. We also have true evil conquering stories. Uh, if, if, if you ever have read a, a story on Mao, I read a history book on Mao. Mao was a monster. Uh, Mao Tsung, he was the leader of the Communist Party in, in China and he killed over 20 million people, if not more. They did horribly, horribly terrible things, ripping babies apart, throwing them down wells, uh, cutting body parts off of people who opposed them. He would starve people intentionally while giving free food away to other nations. He did some of the most horrendous things that you could ever imagine. But here's something that's incredible. The church has grown to almost 30 to 75 million people in communist China. You can't even take a Bible into China. If you are found with a Bible, you will be arrested. In spite of this incredible amount of suffering, you've got the people of China living in underground churches are thriving faster than the place we love and call the United States of America because of this suffering. And then finally, appreciating heaven. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For the momentary light afflictions is producing in us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. And he says the things that we look at, that we see, it's not all there is to this life. And life is going to go on forever and ever. And this life doesn't even come close to comparison, to comparing with what we will have in the future. And so Justin McBriar says this, There is something plausible about this principle. It is very hard to see how we would ever fully appreciate health without illness, wealth without poverty, love without hate. I want to end this uh, sermon with a very um, true and heart-moving story about another reason why God permits evil. And that's because sacrificing to promote the good is a good thing. And if everyone was free and always chose the right thing and no one ever lacked, uh, we would never have this amazing thing called sacrifice. You see, we all have this opportunity to give something of ourselves. And there was this story about a little boy in Kenya named John Thuo, and maybe you've heard about this. Um, He was a beggar, uh, didn't have a mom and dad. He was uh, homeless. And so he would stand out on the street and he would beg for money as cars passed by. And this one decent-looking car with tinted windows uh, pulled up and stopped. And so little John went up, and uh, he knocked on the window to, for it to be rolled down so he could uh, get some money. And there was a woman uh, whose lungs collapsed and was unable to breathe and function. And uh, so she had all of this machinery, and John asked her questions about it, um, you know, why all this was necessary. And uh, his heart was really moved, uh, and he began to weep and cry, looking at this woman who was in such a terrible condition uh, that she had to rely on machinery in order to live. She constantly relies on oxygen, cylinders, and generators to breathe, and she's gone through 12 surgeries at this time. Uh, One surgery ruptured her optical nerve, causing her to go blind, and so she's she's in the passenger side. And so as he asked her about this, uh, his heart was moved in such a way that he took her hand and he began to pray and cry with her. And somebody uh, saw this happening and captured the image and circulated it around social media. And the story has spread throughout the world and generous strangers have raised over three million shillings for Gladys in four days on a Kenyan fundraising site. And she needs seven million shillings in order to get the surgery that she needs in order to live functionally. 
But here's what's so cool is that John, uh, as he prayed with her, after he prayed, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out all the money that he had received that day and he gave it to her in hopes that she could get this surgery, uh, that she might live a normal life. And this is so cool that they've now become really close. John considers Gladys as his own mother and uh, she got him off the streets. She's put him in school and uh, they asked him, do you want to go back to school? And he says, only if I can be close to Gladys. Without evil, this would have never have taken place. And so we find this parable of the weeds and the wheat growing together that God permits it and he allows it, but he's got a plan. And his plan is to save the world and eradicate evil forever so that we can enjoy eternity with him. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know whether or not you're a weed or a wheat. You don't know whether or not when the end of the world happens, you'll be gathered into God's barn or you'll be thrown into the fire. But you have the opportunity to be clear on that. We can teach you the word of God about obeying the gospel. And we offer that every Sunday morning. We also have connection cards that if there's a connection card in the back of your seat and you want to know that you're going to heaven, you want to be assured of that, and maybe you're too afraid to come up front, you can fill out that connection card as this offering is ready to be passed by. And we will reach out to you this week and we will teach you and share the good news that Jesus does save. So I'm going to ask that you stand and you pray with me. Uh, and as we pray over this offering, we're going to sing a song of invitation. Uh, we were going to invite you forward to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God, we want to thank you for stories like John and Gladys who have uh, shown us that sacrificial love and giving up for others is a good thing. God, I pray that as we think about eternity, as we contemplate it, we know that you love us, God. You've died for us. You want to give us grace now. But Lord, we all have that opportunity to reject you. We all have that free will decision to not be in a relationship with you. And God, you love us enough to not force us into heaven. God, I pray for every person in this room that as they deal with the pain that has touched their lives, that they'll try to seek you and be at peace knowing that they can trust you, Lord. They can trust your hand because we trust your hearts. God, I pray that you would bless this offering, that it would be used in such a way that would further your kingdom, that it would supply the needs of the saints, that we could use it to equip uh, us for the work of ministry. Lord, I pray uh, for your kingdom to be grown and blossomed in such a way that the world would know that you reign. God, I pray that you would just love us in such a way that radically changes the way that we live. Father, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.